last time we reminded ourselves that God is personally invested in relating to his image bearers as individuals and as groups. This was shown by his commitment to a personal relationship with his chosen people, Israel, despite their frequent unfaithfulness that grieved him deeply. During our time, the primary relationship he is pursuing on earth is with the church. Going beyond the level of metaphor, he describes his connection with the church as the head to his body. He helps us feel something of his love for the church deeply through the image and the reality of him as the bridegroom and the church as the bride that he has paid so dearly for and that he longs to be reunited with forever. He invites us to contribute in the construction of his building to the nourishment and the growth of his body and to the preparation of his bride. Our purpose in developing these resources, and we know that your purpose in studying them too, is to help you be better equipped for contributing to what God is doing in and through his church. In the last tutorials, as we reminded ourselves of the three primary pictures of the church he has used in his narrative, we touch very briefly on the implications for us. If he is inviting us to be his co-workers in building his living temple, then we need an increasing familiarity with his blueprint so we can work alongside him with care and skill. If, as the head of the church, he wants us to be involved in the process of fitting together, nourishing and bringing his body to maturity, and he does, then we need a growing sense of what health and productivity looks like for the church or for a church. If we are to accept the great honor of helping to prepare his bride for him, then we need to be developing an appreciation and an intuitive feel for the church's needs that he has. So how do we grow in clarity, appreciation, and an intuitive feel for the way Jesus views his church? Well, first of all, because he's the wise architect, the all-powerful head and the loving bridegroom of the church, our capacity for the right kind of contribution depends on how well we know him. Our perfect example, of course, is the relationship that Jesus himself had with his father when he was on earth. He told the father just before his death that he was sending all his disciples out into the world in the same way that he had been sent and that he'd be in us in the same way that the Father is in him. So Jesus' close relationship with the Father and the Spirit in eternity and on the earth guaranteed that he fully understood and was invested in the purpose for which he came or was sent. He has promised that he is always with us. And so as we experience walking and collaborating with him, our minds, our intuition, uh, our wills, our hearts are increasingly aligned to his view of his much-loved church. A second very related avenue through which we grow in appreciation for how the Lord is building and nourishing and um, preparing his church is his written narrative. If you've already completed modules one and two in biblical foundations, you'll know that we use the terminology of narrative to highlight the fact that God has revealed himself through, uh, through the story of how he has interacted with his creation, with the human race. Even though we do find many propositional statements in scripture, and even though we can distill the truth we find there into helpful doctrinal systems, it's him that we need to first be looking for there. When we turn to his word to equip ourselves as Christ's co-workers, it's with the intention of being more closely aligned with his values through the experience of observing what has motivated and directed God's words and actions down through history. One of the ways that God equips us through his narrative to work with understanding and empathy is through the stories of people who've known him and glimpsed what he was doing in the world during their time. Uh, we can see in Abraham's walk of faith and how God drew him into his plans to establish a nation for his global purposes that Abraham had this glimpse. We see others too who also played their part like 
Isaac and, and Jacob and, and Joseph. And there's such a wealth of insights to be gleaned from seeing how God recruited and worked closely with Moses in relating to and guiding the Israelites and Aaron then as they entered the land promised by God. Then later the judges and, and of course the kings and most notably David and also the prophets. But clearly in our quest to be better equipped as Jesus' co-workers in his great work of building and, and guiding and preparing his church, the most directly relevant examples are those men and women he enlisted to be involved at its beginning, at the beginning of the church. As we look back from our vantage point in history at Jesus relating to his followers uh, during the years of his ministry on earth, we can see how he was preparing them for their pivotal roles ahead. And we're able to observe their growing clarity and their commitment to the body after the Spirit's promised arrival at Pentecost, how they were willing to risk everything to see people added. Also their unity and the common bonds as they were followers of the resurrected Messiah. Uh, then the outward thrust, the moving out beyond Jerusalem and Judea and the, the dawning realization of the great scope of God's plans for his his gathering, his ecclesia. This received a huge added impetus after the conversion of the young firebrand Pharisee Paul, who would prove to have such clarity and commitment to the cause of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Luke's often first-hand uh, account in Acts allows us to observe Paul and his co-workers willing to sacrifice their security and their comfort as they traveled widely through their part of the world planting new local fellowships and then taking the responsibility of seeing them grow to maturity. As we engage with the letters that Paul and, and Peter and, and James, John, uh, Jude, uh, the letters that they wrote to individuals and local groups of believers, God's Spirit is eager to equip us with truth and to provide us with a legitimate basis for our authority as Jesus' co-workers and to change us so we can live out the values that the apostles received directly from him. Uh, another source of information uh, and education and even transformation for us as servants of the Lord and his church is the example of others down through history since the time of the apostles. In a very real sense, this is God's ongoing narrative that is still being written in the story of the lives of his people. As God's word itself clearly states, his specific revelation that has been preserved within the 66 books of the Bible is complete. There's no new truth to be added. But God has continued to demonstrate his amazing power and his, his wisdom and his grace as his people have given themselves wholeheartedly to be involved in his, his great temple building project. When we have opportunity to hear the stories of how he has worked with, with weak, uh, flawed, very human co-workers like us to achieve some amazing things, it inspires us to make ourselves available as well. We also have the opportunity to learn from the things they have attempted that have proven to be effective or, or indeed otherwise. But this last point about evaluating effectiveness raises a critical question or, or rather a, a range of questions as we consider our own contribution to his purposes. As, as far as efforts to see a church grow and, and become mature to be fruitful or when it comes to initiatives to plant a new church, we, where we ask questions like, uh, how do we evaluate effectiveness? Is it possible to define any universals given the nearly uh, infinite range of, of contexts and circumstances in which church uh, work can happen? Does having a plan mean that God is no longer uh, leading us? Is it even appropriate to think in terms of, of objectives and effectiveness and strategies when it relates to the, the body and bride of Christ? Uh, can we take any steps to be more effective ourselves without being judgmental or 
disparaging the enormous sacrifice others have made for the Lord and his church. Uh, These and other related questions are legitimate. We do not want to take an approach that is simplistic or reductionist to pretend we can write formulas for something that is so complex, even on a human scale, and, and that ultimately rests in the infinite wisdom and love of God. We need to keep clearly in mind Paul's concern that the Colossians might become enthralled by human philosophies rather than the truth from Christ, which uh, is Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Or that the Corinthians might be corrupted in their pure and undivided devotion to him, uh, 2 Corinthians eleven three. Any plans or strategies we lay out must never violate the imperative of walking daily with him and being led by his spirit. We should be deeply appreciative of any effort or sacrifice that's made to share the gospel and and to build up the Lord's ecclesia and never allow ourselves to take a judgmental, superior stance towards his servants. But as we've noted through the narrative a number of times, when God created us in his image, it was with the whole range of capacities that reflect his Uh, intellect and will, emotions and so on. And his spirit lives in us to help us use those fully to, to worship and to serve God. The partnership that he calls us into in the building of his church is a genuine one. So if we're walking in dependence on him and truly seeking to know him and understand his truth, we can and should use our minds to consider what is productive and what isn't. Taking the correct stance of humility and appreciation, we can evaluate the effectiveness of strategies that have been used by others, uh, church propagators and cultivators down through history, to learn from their mistakes and seek to emulate their successes. We can look at what has lasted and ask ourselves why. And we can look at current approaches and glean from what is proving to be effective. And, and avoid what isn't being effective. In our daily lives, in every area of human initiative, whether it's exploration or scientific discovery, medicine, technological advances, even in sport, we know that nothing worthwhile is ever achieved without a lot of dedicated, focused effort. That's just the way it is. The way God has set things up as the great author creator. If anything significant is going to be done well, it takes an individual or more usually a team of people with the vision, the passion, detailed clarity, and the willingness to do whatever it takes to see it through. Strangely though, when it comes to the enormously challenging project the Lord has invited us to be part of, building his church, we could also describe it as seeing his body grow to to full maturity or preparing his bride for him. When it comes to this huge project, there's often a reticence from believers to apply those same principles that apply to every other part of reality. As we've already highlighted in this tutorial, it is most definitely our passion and love for Jesus Christ and his church that qualifies us to be involved in his work. In Paul's eloquent words to his friends in uh, in Corinth he says if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others I would be nothing we know that's first Corinthians chapter 13 verse verse 2 but even though love is the overarching principle that must motivate our efforts that shouldn't be seen in opposition to the pursuit of a clear vision or of asking God to guide us as we identify, uh, sorry, identify ways to be more effective or even to glean from other areas of human knowledge, for example, from linguistics or anthropology or even business principles. We should never assume that we can come close to defining everything about the glorious unfolding mystery that is the church But that does not mean that we should shy away from trying in the same way that just because we know it isn't our strength that will finally achieve anything, we shouldn't hesitate to give it everything we've got.
The rest of this Module 7 will be introducing and familiarizing you with a resource that helps us pursue that clarity about how God works in and through His church and to help us chart our course towards effective contribution in His purposes.